Have you ever considered the incredible odds against Christianity? The self-proclaimed son of God and his ragtag band of merry misfits head out on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago to spread their message. They're not educated, they're not important by the world's standards, and, and the gospel that they began to preach spread like an outbreak all over the region and all over the world. It spread all throughout Judea and Samaria, and even today it's making its way to the uttermost parts of the world. I mean, just think how it spread. It went north and south and east and west. It crossed rivers and mountains and oceans. It went on donkey back and horseback. It went on camelback. I mean, it crossed the most incredible terrain that you and I could ever imagine. And one day, one glorious day, it crossed an ocean and it came to you and me. I mean, the gospel has made its way all over the world, but how did it happen? Well, it happened through the multiplication of small churches. Within just a few short generations, Christianity had grown from an obscure regional uprising to a worldwide movement. And it happened through this multiplication of small churches. Churches that at first didn't look like much, led by men and women who didn't look like much either. These tenacious men and women, they stood boldly in the face of famine and persecution and peril and sword. And the church became an unstoppable force that Jesus himself claimed the gates of hell even could not prevail against. I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes when I'm sitting at a stoplight in a, in a, in a big city, I have my windows down, it's a nice day, there's the city noise buzzing around, and I look over next to me and there's a median between me and the other lanes of traffic as I'm sitting at the traffic light. And I notice in that median that there are some, some scrappy, tenacious little weeds that are busting through the cracks in the concrete. And I look at those weeds and sometimes if I let myself, my mind wanders a little bit and I start to think, how did that weed get there? I mean, just think about the incredible odds that that weed overcame to get where it was. I mean, it went through literally feet of packed gravel. It was deprived of sunlight and water and any sort of nourishment. And yet that scrappy little seed busted forth from feet under the earth and snaked its way through concrete and busted forth out into the sunlight. And I think those tenacious little weeds on medians and city streets all over the world, I think those are nature's equivalent to the local church. I mean, you just can't get rid of it. Right? It seems like history, church history tells us that the more we try to snuff out and cover up the church, the more the church grows and prospers. And in a place where a weed could grow in a constant buzz of traffic and smog and oil and smut and litter and heat, not to mention the fact that virtually, uh, it had virtually no water or sun. Yet there are these stubborn little, little plants that, that poke their way through and I think these are like the church. When I think about new churches and struggling churches just working to make their way in the nooks and crannies of our society, I think about these tenacious little plants, and I, I want to root for them. I want to root for these little churches. I want to root that they'll make it. I want to root that they will, uh, uh, for them that they will, they will literally take root, and they will grow, and they will become a force for the kingdom of God in this world. So as we begin today to consider the task of building God's church, let us not forget that God's church is really not in distress. You know, I'm going to say some things today through the course of the class. They're going to make us think that God's church is in peril, that it might fall apart. It's going to feel very fragile. But I want you to know that according to the word of God, his church is not in distress. He knows exactly what's going on with his church and he's taking good care of her. She's under his sovereign rule and protection. And she will break through even the hardest of concrete. In due time. 
A pastor that I respect, Mark Dever, he says this about church planting. He says, church planting is the normal business of the local church. And the local church is where we're taught to obey everything that Jesus commanded us. You know, I think the majority of Christians like the idea of church planting. I think they like it conceptually. In fact, I don't know that I've ever met a Christian who opposes church planting on principle. I mean, everyone seems to like the idea. Even so, the vast majority of Christians, though, and churches, they'll never give serious consideration to planting a new church. Even church leaders, they just don't think about such things. They're too busy growing ministries to think about expanding the gospel into other places. I think one of the primary reasons that church leaders and churches and Christians think this way is that they can't point to any particular biblical foundation for church planting in the scripture. That they don't know for sure if the Bible really commands us to plant churches or not. They can't pinpoint anywhere in the scripture that would tell us precisely to go and plant churches. But just because the average Christian doesn't know where to look in the Bible to find church planting doesn't mean that there's not scriptural support for church planting. So let's start our study together in this course by asking ourselves, is there any biblical rationale for church planting? And I want to start this conversation by answering the question, is there any biblical rationale for church planting? By saying, yes, we know that church planting is important because we know the church is important. You see, farming matters because food matters, right? Hospitals matter because people matter. And church planting matters because the church matters. Not everyone sees it that way, though. Even some professing Christians don't think that the church is really all that important at all. Many in our society consider churches to be irrelevant or corrupt or, or antiquated or contentious, which, of course, all are true, right? Civic and governmental authorities often consider churches as special interest groups that hinder the municipal progress and profit even. So I'd like to take a moment for you to consider with me, just to think for a few minutes by yourself uh, about two questions. The first question I'd like you to consider is what role does the church currently play in our society? When you think of society at large, what role does the local church play in society at large? And secondly, I'd like you to consider how do Christians, Christians that you know, professing Christians, how do they think about and talk about the local church? So think about those two things, jot down some answers, and while you're doing that, I'd like to introduce you to a church planter. I'm Ken Giadachi, church planter with All People's Community Church in Fairfax, Virginia. I'm married with one wife and three kids. And um, God's called me to church, plant a church here to reach the people here in the Fairfax area. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up church. I didn't trust Jesus until I was 16 years old. And so my heart is for lost people. And so I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. All of my friends were in my neighborhood were either white. And then in my school, they bust us to integrate us into a black school inside the city. And so here I am. I have a context. My friends are either white or black and I'm able to flow with these relationships because they look at me and they didn't know what to think of me because in North Carolina, there are more churches than there were Asians. And then God brought me here to Fairfax, Virginia where there's so many Asians in this area. And that context has enabled me to white, black, now Asian and back to my, my roots and to be able to identify with these people and to reach the uh, people contextually with the gospel. I was serving at a church for 12 years in, in this area, but God placed a big burden on my heart to plant churches for not just to plant churches and to be to start something new, but really this is the single most effective way to reach lost people. And not just lost people, but the types of people, people that are new in the area, people that are, are millennials, the younger generations, people that are unchurched, people that are de-churched, people that are different ethnic groups. And when I think about the ministry, my 12 years in my previous church, all the things that, that God stirred in my heart that I longed for and I lived to minister, it was same thing, younger people, lost people, internationals, and new people. And that's why I'm planning a church to reach these types of people. 
when we look at the Bible, Paul was the ultimate church planner. He would go to strategic cities and he would plant churches. He was fulfilling Jesus' command for the great commissions of going and making disciples. And we say, how do we do that? And the biblical model that we see that was effective is multiplying churches and reaching people in that context, whether it's Ephesus or Rome or Crete, wherever it may be, by raising up indigenous leaders who are part of that city and to reach that city. One of the greatest challenges of church planning is leaving what is comfortable and sec secure. I have a family, three kids. My wife has been married coming up 20 years. She has, is sick with Lyme disease. And for, for God to call me to do, leave all of that stability and to do this, it, it's, it's not something that I would encourage for anyone. But if you're called, we must obey. What did that look like for me? My wife said this. She said, it was like jumping off a cliff. But for someone like me, I love jumping off cliffs if Jesus is calling me to do that. But it's hard for my family. It's hard for my kids. You know, they're having to jump with me. And I'm not pulling them. This is, we're doing it together. And they're seeing God's faithfulness through this. God has financially provided in miraculous ways. We are seeing God increase in who He is and how holy and how awesome that He is. And I, if I were to do it again, I, I, of course just for this experience, not necessarily just planting the church, allowing my family to see God's faithfulness and His greatness. Our hope is to plant a church that's holistic, that really makes a difference in the community, to bless all peoples. It's not necessarily a church for ourselves that we can say, look at the numbers or, or the attendance, the giving and all that, and, and look what we're doing. We want people in the community to say the very same thing when they go to the grocery store, if the grocery store would ever leave, that they would say, why, why are you leaving? We, we need this grocery store. We want that, that kind of gospel impact, that the Lord would use us to save people, yes, of course, but also to, to love them, um, connect them together, and to equip them so that they may be sent out and be a blessing in the community as well. I think it's one of the most exciting things that you could ever go on. To be able to start something from scratch and be there from the very beginning and to see people come to faith in Christ, mature in faith together as a church family and to develop, start something new and to make an impact in the community. We need people that are mature in their faith. We need generous people. We need gifted people. We need people to come on board to help us do something like this, to reach their community. Don't they want to reach their neighbors, their coworkers? That's my desire. And that's why I'm planning this church, because I want to see the gospel go forth and touch people's lives. We definitely need all kind of support and prayer, obviously. We need financial support. We need those who are even on the outside may have giftings, whether they can make videos, they can help with a website, or they can help with children's ministry, that they can be a short-term missionary in the community to give of their time, maybe six months, maybe a year, to come serve the children in the children's ministry, play on the worship team, or whatever they may be that may free up the, the core uh, people on the, on the church plant. A church planting isn't just for pioneers, people that are crazy and gonna step out in faith. It's really for everybody. It's for the regular Joe that's established and part of a life of a regular church, that they can also be a part of the, a, a, this church planning movement by not just thinking about their church, but thinking about their city. How can we best strategically reach this city? I've been blessed that God has brought faithful people, people that not just believe in the vision, but really love me and support me. This, this is what I need more than just people doing things. Church planners need people. You don't have to be the, the, the all-star team. We're not looking for green berets of church planting. We're looking for faithful people that will love well and serve the Lord faithfully. So is the church irrelevant? Is it antiquated? Is it out of date? Is it useless in our society? Well, the answer is an obvious no. The church is not out of date. It's not useless. It's not irrelevant. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Jesus' church is the most important institution in the history of the world. Because Jesus is the most important figure in human history. When all of the world's books are closed and, 
And when all of earth's humanity is swallowed up in God's eternity, the church, I believe, will be celebrated as the most significant institution in human history. An author that I think a lot of, Kevin DeYoung, and his co-author Ted Kluck, they wrote this in an article in the Washington Post. They said, we love the church because Christ loved the church. She is his bride, yes, a harlot at times, but his bride nonetheless. Being washed clean by the water of the word, like Ephesians 5 tells us, if you're into Jesus, then don't rail on his bride. Jesus died for the church, so don't be bothered by a little of dying to self for the church's sake. If you keep in mind that everyone there at church, including yourself, is a sinner, and that Jesus is the point of all of it, then your dreams and your kids and your church experience might not be as lame as you fear. So, why should we love the church? Well, Ted and Kevin give us an idea why we should love the church, but it's because Christ loves the church, first and foremost. Jesus loves the church, and for me and, and my family... It's not possible for you to love me and not love my wife. If you love me and you hate my wife or you ignore my wife, then you're not loving me very well. You see, we come together and the same is true for Christ and his church. We can't love Christ and turn our backs on his church. And the second thing I want you to see is it's because we can't obey Christ without the church. This may not seem right to you. You may think, I can obey Christ just fine. Without the church, but the Bible would tell us a different story. Consider 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 and 26, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. You see, our problems are divided in the church, and our joys are multiplied in the church. The church helps us to see the plank in our own eyes that we cannot see ourselves. The church shows us living examples of the Christian lives to model our lives after. How many times in the local church have you observed another Christian and said, I wish I was more like that brother or that sister? See, we can't obey Christ rightly without the church. The church is a gift that God has given to us for obedience. The third thing to see is we can't even know Christ without the church. The church is actually an agency that brings the knowledge of the gospel to us. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. He says that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. That the church actually is the thing that displays the glory of God to the world. The church is, is the reflector of the glory of God to the world. And the last thing I want you to see is we love the church because the church is eternal. Many Christians in our society give themselves to their work or their homes or their hobbies or their families. All good things, but none of them are eternal. The church, though, is eternal. It's eternal. It lasts forever. Jesus' church is an eternal family and worthy of the severe investment of our lives. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do Far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at his power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. You see, the church is an eternal entity. Timothy Keller says it like this. Virtually all of the great evangelistic challenges of the New Testament are basically calls to plant new churches, not simply to share the faith. You see, sharing the faith is not enough. It's short because we're called to make disciples, not just to make converts. So is church planting in the Bible? Is, it, does the Bible command us or direct us to plant churches? Though you won't find any particular place in the Bible where you read a verse that says, Thou shalt plant churches. That doesn't mean that church planting isn't a, a deeply biblical idea. If you're looking for it, you'll notice church planting all throughout the New Testament. For example, Jesus himself is a church planter. In two ways, Jesus is a church planter. First, Jesus established the universal church, right? He brought the church to the world. Everyone here is a Christian because of Jesus. And so in that way, Jesus established the universal church in the world, making him a church planter. He is the good shepherd that shepherds all of us. 
On a cosmic level, Jesus is a church planter. He invented the church and he sustains the church. But on a more local level, he also led a small congregation of disciples, right? He went out, he compelled them, he gathered them together, he taught them the word of God. In fact, he was the word of God. He shared communion with them and he commissioned them to go out and spread the gospel and plant churches. Jesus himself was a church planter. Paul was a church planter. We know that. His commissioning by the church at Antioch in Acts chapter 13 marks the beginning of this incredible journey of church planting for the apostle Paul. Over the course of 13 years, Paul embarked on three missionary journeys during which he he traveled more than 7,000 miles. Just consider that. Paul traveled by foot or horseback 7,000 miles and planted at least in that time frame on that one journey 14 new churches. Paul himself was an aggressive church planter. Not just Paul, but the rest of the apostles were church planters too. The apostles themselves were church planters. In the book of Acts is the account of their church planting ministry. They planted churches with little support from other churches and against great political and religious opposition. Ultimately, their commitment to obey the Great Commission by planting churches cost them their lives. Speaking of the Great Commission, the Great Commission itself is a call to start new churches. Spoken by Jesus in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission is essentially a call to plant new churches. We can say this because baptizing, teaching, and making disciples, that's exactly what churches do, right? I mean, churches do that. That's the job description of the local church. And so, baptizing, teaching, and making disciples is the job description of the local church. And when Jesus says, go and do that, he's saying, go and do the church. Additionally, that dozen men that heard Jesus say that, how did they respond to what Jesus said? Well, the book of Acts tells us that they spent their entire lives establishing new churches. So my question is, if we hear the Great Commission and respond in a different way than the apostles did, who do you think misunderstood it? Church planting in the book of Acts is incredible. If you just pay attention, Jesus sends out his apostles to plant churches in Jerusalem. That's how it starts in Acts 1, 8, and and in chapter 2. And then in Acts 8, Philip preaches the gospel, and then he compels the members of that church they planted, the church at Jerusalem. He compels those members to go on into what he calls the villages of Samaria to carry the gospel. And then in Acts 9, Saul, the greatest missionary that the world has ever known, is converted from a church persecutor to a church planter. And in Acts 11, Barnabas is sent by the church at Jerusalem to plant and lead the church at Antioch. And then over in Acts 13, that church at Antioch, why Paul and Barnabas were leading the church there, the Holy Spirit sets apart those two men and sends them out on that missionary journey that I just mentioned a few minutes ago that resulted in 14 new churches. The church at Antioch embraced this calling and they immediately sent them out to plant new churches. And Paul's ministry of planting churches forms really the rest of the story of the book of Acts. So is church planting in the Bible? Yes, it's saturated all throughout the New Testament. And it's not just the book of Acts either. Honestly, if you pay close attention, you'll notice that many of the letters in the New Testament, they're written and addressed directly to church planters. They're they're given to rebuke or instruct church planters and their congregations. The majority of the Uh, of the the New Testament and of the prominent figures in the New Testament, the characters in the New Testament are all church planters or members of church planting teams. So I'd like you to see that like many doctrines in the Bible, the most compelling case for church planting is found in really a synthesis of all of these biblical ideas to look at the whole of the New Testament scripture to see that church planting is very much a part of the fabric of the New Testament. The phrase church planting is not mentioned in the Bible, but then again, the word trinity is not mentioned in the Bible either. Does that mean that the trinity isn't scriptural? Well, of course it doesn't mean that. The synthesis of many texts leads us to a clear understanding of the trinity, and the same is true for church planting. Virtually every evangelistic church in North America, understand me, virtually every evangelistic church in North America would agree with the statement, uh, the Great Commission is for every church. I mean, all of our churches would agree with that. I mean, you could just consider it. The churches that you know, if you were to ask them, is the Great Commission apply to you and your church? All of them would say yes. But then if you were to ask a different question, if you were to ask the question, 
does, is every church commanded or required to be engaged in, in church planting? Churches would say, oh no, that's not necessarily true. It's a, it's a ministry, you could take it or leave it. But I, I'd like to present a different idea. I don't think that's the case. I believe that church planting and the Great Commission are one and the same. Therefore, churches who aren't engaged in establishing and renewing local churches, those are churches that are not obeying the Great Commission. Yet, far fewer are able to accept that every church and every Christian are involved in, uh, should be involved in church planting. So hear me, my friends. The Great Commission is, uh, is about church planting. And if it's going to be properly fulfilled in our churches, if we're going to, to obey the Great Commission and do it right, it's going to involve church planting. Now, that may seem like a bold statement, but again, I'll, let me just mention these two reasons that I believe this is true. The substance of the Great Commission, go, baptize, teach, make disciples, that is, it, that is the substance of the church. That's the job description of the church. And the apostles, they heard Jesus' command to go, baptize, teach, and make disciples. And those 12 men interpreted his teaching as church planting. And they gave their lives for it. And so we should at least give consideration to how God might use us in our lives to plant new churches. Friends, when we plant a new church, it's like we set up a factory for making new disciples. We can go into a community and we can do an evangelistic event or an evangelistic endeavor and then go back home and perhaps we feel good about what we've done. But the truth is when we go into a community and we put our hands to planting a new church, we, we institute this, this machinery that continues to churn out new disciples of Jesus and continues to mature Jesus' disciples. We do something of invaluable good in a community when we plant a church there. It's like we put a new door into the kingdom of heaven when we plant a new church. We put a new access point to the Lord Jesus inside of a community when we go into that community and plant a church. In 1845, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon spoke to his congregation about this issue of church planting. And here's what he had to say, and I'll finish with this. He said, we encourage our members to leave us to found other new churches, nay, we seek to persuade them to do it. We ask them to scatter throughout this land to become the godly seed that God shall bless. And I believe so long as we do this, we will prosper. Join me in prayer. Father, we believe and embrace that your word commands us to spread your message. And we see that the pattern of the apostles was well, not just to go and evangelize, but to go and make disciples in a new city, in a new community. So God, would you help us to readjust our mindsets to understand that what you're doing in this world is you are, you are bringing your gospel to places through the local church. Would you help us to value more in our heart the local church, to love her more and give ourselves to her prosperity even more. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.